it's good to see you all here and um, I had to step in in to replace my colleague Professor Anna Norby Teglund today as she had to participate at a funeral so that was a bit of an unfortunate thing that happened but I tried to put together um, a presentation to present to you the EU funded project in fact that, that we are coordinating me and Anna and uh, I will give you sort of an overview of the INFECT project and tell you what it's all about and sort of the approach that we have taken to advance our understanding of necrotizing soft tissue infections and I will also um, introduce the necrotizing soft tissue infections to you. My name is Mattias Svensson and I'm working at the Center for Infectious Medicine at Karolinska Institutet in Stockholm at the South Campus that's uh, where the former Huddinge Hospital, which is now Karolinska University Hospital Huddinge. Um, I'm an associate professor in immunology and I would say that most of um, what I have learned so far regarding dealing with this EU project has been sort of a, a bit of a journey and a lot of new things um, to be teached, um, both when it comes to sort of managing the project but also a lot of new interesting things when it comes to systems medicine and systems biology which I have not really been working with previously. As I said uh, my main focus is sort of on immunology uh, but I have always been um, uh, in some way linked to infectious diseases as well. <coughs> so this is a in fact this is a consortium that started 2013. We actually sort of um, got together already 2000 11, 12, some of the people that were then in eventually involved in the consortium uh, and also then participate in writing the application. Um, Anna, or Professor Norbert Teglund, has had a long standing interest in necrotizing soft tissue infections and she had tried to raise money for being able to sort of expand on this and actually building up, at least within Scandinavia, um, sort of a biobank or clinical database where we could start to gather information on these patients. Um, um, as she was not successful nationally, we turned to EU and uh, tried there when there was a call on systems medicine and we put together sort of this consortium that I will now present to you. And we are about then halfway through, uh, 2015 June now, and um, uh, we have definitely made quite a lot of progress, I would say, and I will show you what we have done so far and there will sort of be a mix now where we pre present the different work packages to you what we are doing within the project but also at the end showing some of the progress in terms of the, of the actual data and results that are now starting to come now. Um, for me it's fine if you interrupt me and ask questions during my presentation or you can keep the questions for later when, when um, I finished. I will also stay for lunch, so there will be time for you to, to um, discuss with me if you have any particular qu questions then. Um, this is just an outline of the INFECT partners. So there is um <coughs> currently 14 partners. There are some movements, the partners move to different uh, facilities within their countries, respective countries, and, and certain things happen to companies and such, so we just have to replace the numbers of partners. But it's still 14 partners um, involved in the project. No one has dropped out as of yet. Anyway, that's good. And this is from our first annual meeting that we had in um, in Portugal, um, where some of the most sort of relevant uh, partner members were gathered. Um, there are of course larger teams than this, so there we are, and many more than those shown on this photo that are actually involved in the project. And then going into the necrotizing soft tissue infections. So they are infections of diverse microbiological etiology. So there can be either mono or polymicrobial. That means there's either one or several different pathogens causing the infections. Um, very common are the beta hemolytic streptococci, in particular group A and group G streptococci. There are also some uh, infections caused by Staphylococcus aureus, but I would say not so often monomicrobial infections, then it's rather sort of the, the polymicrobial infections, it seems. This is an extreme uh, um, end of skin and soft tissue infections. You do have mild forms of 
skin infections caused by these pathogens, but what we are studying here is really the, the most extreme form of the infections. And at large, I would say that the host and pathogen traits contributing to disease are unknown. We start to know more and more, of course, and, and some parts are <coughs> we have started to get an idea of what's happening. But there's a lot more to learn. There are, a lot, of course, a lot of clinical challenges uh, when it comes to these infections, and we always try to have the clinical perspective as a focus when within this project and also in other all other other uh, other projects as well, because we think that that's important. And this is about systems medicine, so of course the clinical part is really important, and maybe I would say the most relevant part of it, because that's the basis and that's the reason why we're doing this. We're trying to understand the disease and how we can maybe in the future help those that are suffering from the infections. So these <coughs> infections are associated with a su substantial risk of death and also loss of limbs. And I will show you some um, images of this uh, uh, soon. Um, and there's a demand of immediate uh, diagnosis and really an adequate intervention very early on. So it's important that the medical doctors are able to identify those patients that are going to be very severely sick at a very early time point. I sometimes say that if there's a doctor delay, there is also sort of a risk of, of losing either life or uh, or limbs. These infections are often associated with intensive care and surgery and lengthy rehabilitations, which of course means that they are very costly. Although they're not that common, but once people are affected there are associations with major costs. Um, there are frequent complications as the patients go into shock and there's oftentimes also multi-organ failure involved. Um, there are many um, components in these infections as well so they are multifactorial. There are many various uh, comorbidities which we start to get an idea of how they may affect and whether you become more or less susceptible to the infections. But the pathophysiology is, <coughs> as of yet, largely unknown. So this is one case um, that we oftentimes use to show as an example how rapid the infection can progress. And in this case, the there was a fatal outcome. So <coughs> this was one... Um, 38 year old male and he was previously well <coughs> so one Saturday he cut his finger when he was cleaning his skates and just a few days later less than a week he as he had sort of persistent symptoms he was eventually admitted to the hospital but this was now too late as he developed toxic shock and there was a fatal outcome within 12 hours and this is a bit of a disturbing pi picture but this is what it looks like um, at that stage. So this is really the severe consequence of these infections. As I said, they are not that common, but when they happen, there's a really rapid progress and there is a risk of losing your life. <coughs> so we think that there is a great need to better understand this. Sometimes you can see these headlines in newspapers about flesh-eating bugs or flesh-eating bacteria that, <coughs> that people were killed by these in bacteria. <coughs> so this is then the five objectives of the INFECT project, um, which I have sort of shortened down a little bit, but <coughs> just to give you an idea of what we had in mind when we first started and wrote this uh, application. So <coughs> we wanted to take sort of a top-down systems approach to start with, so that you have as a basis, you have the clinical side things and then aiming at identifying the six disease signatures and underlying networks that contribute to NSTI outcome using then the systems medicine approach. But at the same time also using a bottom-up systems approach where we actually do try to modulate or mimic the infections in experimental models and I will come back to show you how we also do that. So we try to work from two sides so to say. And one of the most important things, of course, is the outcome that whether we find <coughs> maybe uh, some new targets or 
uh, that we could potentially then use not only for diagno developing diagnostic tools but also to um, um, develop novel immunotherapies or intervention strategies. So these are the work packages within <coughs> the consortium of the project. There are nine different uh, work packages. I'll just go through them quite quickly on <coughs> in this schematic drawing. But I will go through with you sort of work package by work package just to show you what we are doing within the different work packages. Um, so we have the work package two up here, which is the hospitals involved where we enroll the patients. And then we have several different other um, work packages, one work package one which is the experimental murine model, we have another work package six which I'm responsible for where we do artificial tissues and try to modulate or mimic the, the infections in vitro. <coughs> we do have the two most central work packages I would say in a way because they are where we're doing all the omics analysis and where we integrate omics analysis into the different platforms that has been established to do the mo computational modeling. And in work package 5 we, <coughs> we do look into more detail in the tissue biopsies and tissue samples that we get from the patients. And then as work package 7 there is a small company involved to develop new diagnostic tools. We have a work package 8 which is responsible for dissemination um, of the knowledge that we obtain within the project and then we have work package 9 which is the man which is dealing with the management of the project which Anna and I am responsible for as well. So this is, uh, I won't go through everything now in detail with you, I uh, will be able to share most of these slides with you later on so that you can also have them um, and look at them later. But within work package 1 as I mentioned we do have an experimental murine model that we're using and oftentimes when you use murine models you use them because they are inbred and each individual mouse will be very uh, sort of identical to another and you think that that's a good for your experimental setup you will not introduce too much variation but we do here exactly the opposite because these mice are bred so that they will be different genetically and that's sort of the point with this that we do because we want to identify whether there are any genes associated with susceptibility or resistance. I'm not very um, good at this in particular but because th this our partner in the United States that do have this model and worked on that for quite some time and used that as a model to study these type of infections caused by Streptococci and Staphylococci. But that's just to give you an idea, to forget about the inbred mouse strains, these are rather sort of outbred in that sense that they will be more similar than to human population where we have all different genetic variations. Um, and and <coughs> this model, the experimental model system, will be then used to uh, take bacterial isolates generated from the patients suffering from the infections and then take the isolates and infect the mice with and then <coughs> follow, monitor the infections. And then it can look like this, that at certain days post-infection you have some mice that survive, which may have a little bit of skin involvement, but you will have those that have much more severe skin involvement and which will have to be sacrificed because they will not survive. And this then can give you an idea why is this one more susceptible than this and then you can go back and look at that there genetically and see whether they are different and that can help you pinpointing down whether there is um, specific genes involved. I will come back to that a little bit more in detail later on during the presentation. So <coughs> coming then to work package 2 which is uh, in a way Without that work package, we would not be able to do this because uh, because th this is where we enroll the patients. So these are all the clinical partners and the um, um <coughs> nurses, medical doctors at five different hospitals. So there's the Riggs Hospitality in Copenhagen. There is a hospital in Karlskrona, Sweden, and the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm. Um, Haukland University Hospital in Bergen. And then also... Um, the um, hospital in uh, Sahlgrenska hospital in Gothenburg <coughs> and they are recruiting patients as well as controls and they collect all the clinical data which go into a centralized interactive database they do 
make sure that we get as many uh, bacterial isolates as we can and also collecting blood to different time points at, as well as taking tissue biopsies as there are most in mo of most in most cases i would say that there are there is surgery involved in this infection so that we do get oops we we do get um, tissue biopsies taken at these times when there are surgery and we get tissue that's either more distal or centered to depending on how, how it looks when we have the infection so at the end of 2014 we had enrolled 196 patients and this is very much according to plan because we had estimated about a hundred a year <coughs> and it's only 184 reported here but that was because only 184 had been entered into the database at that stage um, and then you we get a lot more information than this but this is just to give you an idea that of course we get in terms of when it comes to gender, age um, and um, body mass indexes and there whether they are smokers or non-smokers and whether they consume alcohol or not and, and also whether there are certain type of treatments um, or comorbidities and so forth but there's a lot of information within this uh, database which will um, which will be used later on when we actually go into uh, do more of analysis of this and then coming to the work package 3 where <coughs> the, the goal is to identify specific pattern disease signatures uh, using the systems biology process. Uh, this work package is doing most of the omics analysis, so this is the transcriptomics, proteomics and genomics analysis, both on the host and pathogen side. So, so that's very also Once all the samples have been collected, this is of course a really an important work package because a lot of the analysis will be done there. <coughs> Um, so this is what it can look like. We then have a lot of bacteria now collected at the different sites, clinical sites, and they have now been genotyped. And you can here see the location where they were taken, tissue, blood, uh, where there was in the wound. Or so, so we get all this information as well. Um, and whether there were treatments um, uh, using IVIG, which is uh, human immunoglobulins that are given to the patients in some cases, but sometimes not. So all this information, is of course, will be important in the end when we come to do more of analysis of wh whether a treatment was more or less uh, su successful. Um, and they are also uh, looked at in terms of their M types, because looking at streptococcal in the bac bacteria, uh, one important virulence factor is the M proteins, and there are about 200 different M proteins. So that's something we're all sort of keeping track of. And here you can see a little bit of the distribution of the streptococcal uh, bacteria and also the M types, so that, that the M1 is sort of seems to be the most predominant. So this type of information we do get out. So then another really important, important part uh, here has been to establish now <coughs> that we can do transcript, uh, transcription profiling of the samples and we decided to go for the approach of doing dual RNA sec, and that means that we can look at both the bacteria and um, host uh, uh, transcription profile at the same time. And it had to be set up so that we could process and analyze patient samples, but also samples from the artificial tissue model, as well as the mouse model, as well as the bacteria cultured in, in, in pure culture medium. So that has taken a bit of time to get this all worked out, but it's now up and running and we are getting uh, RNA sequences out right now. Um, <coughs> and then going, going over to VP4, where also all the data that we generate within the other work packs will actually go in eventually and, and be then used for the in those platforms once populated to do the computational modeling and this will then hopefully help us to reveal key molecular networks and developing new ways of looking at this and looking at the host pattern interactions at, at an early time of, of the disease and hopefully we can identify new biomarkers and, and also maybe new diagnostic uh, targets uh, as well as uh, novel therapeutic targets that's the end term of that so to say and 
this is just then to show a quite complicated schematic drawing of the data sharing and processing that's ongoing here so that the work package for actually is getting all the different type of data from the different work packages and and how that communication has to work and this is really a central part in all this that we can get the mouse experiment experiments and the data from that 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 needs to feed into whether do the computational modeling and of course it has to be f given feedback back to those do doing that whether you have to refine your models or, or, or experiments or not and <coughs> there are um, data that can go to the company that working on on developing novel diagnostic tools and um, of course uh, as well as uh, just the knowledge generated that, that is also disseminated uh, to others but this is the very complex network of, of channels of data that is a i would say two and a half year now within the project this has just started to work but but that has been sort of a bit of a challenge of course to get it to work but we have had to set up many things i mean we had to uh, start we started really from the beginning no i mean all the medical doctors nurses were of course within the different hospitals but they also had to gather now in new constellations to be actually able to work for the infect project as well as we had to to um, set up this um, platforms to be able to modulate the data as well as setting up all the um <coughs> It's processes to generate the transcriptomic data, for example, the genotyping. Uh, although the different partners had the expertise in this, but now in particular is working with slightly different type of samples and so forth. So within work package five, which is led by Professor Norbert Teglund, um, <coughs> the aim is to validate results generated in some of the other work packages also test model driven hypothesis and data and look in the tissue because they do collect all the tissue bio biopsies and do <coughs> uh, look into whether we have the bacteria in the tissue or not um, and this is just an example of how we can look when you do immunofreshence analysis and when you look at viable bacteria versus non-viable bacteria so that you can actually identify within different patients in within the wounds that there are viable bacteria <coughs> present and this can also then be combined with different type of um, markers uh, important for understanding host uh, tissue responses and inflammation. Within work package six, which I'm responsible for, the goal was to establish an um, artificial skin tissue model, which we could infect and then follow I in infections over time to hopefully identify and confirm tissue specific host bacterial disease interactions and use these um, uh, samples also for the omics analysis um, again confirming then go <coughs> what, uh, the data that we generate with what they see also in the work package file where they look in the um, in more detail within the tissue biopsies of the patients and we hope also to be able to use the model to test novel therapies and also to identify novel molecular targets this is, I will <coughs> show you some more of this uh, later on, but this is just to give you a rough idea of how a model like this l l uh, is composed. So it should be an art architecture that resembles real tissue. The cellular composition should be then multi-layered and polarized. We do not add any exogenous growth factors and we just let the, uh, the tissue be built up like this, that you have a scaffold including collagen and fibroblasts and on top of that you have the keratinocytes and, and then they stratify and become very much similar to uh, a normal stratified skin epithelium and then they are ready to be infected um, within work package 7 um, the idea is then to translate the obtained results into um, developing novel diagnostic tools for this type of infections and that is based on either DNA or protein analysis. Um, <coughs> so for the DNA that will be on the pathogen side, protein could be either on the on the bacteria or the host side. Work package eight is the dissemination of the results. And I would recommend you if you're interested in this project, you visit the homepage. 
and you can get in more information there regarding all the different work packages and partners involved. If you're particularly interested in some aspect of what I've talked about here, I can maybe not answer all those questions that you have, but please go to the web page and you can also contact um, others within the consortium then if you're interested in doing that. Um, in work package 9, the last work package is dealing with the management and um, we try to provide a sufficient management and administration uh, of the process possible to fulfill all uh, requirements and we are using something called Team Engine which is our internal web site basically where we share all the data with the different partners and, and, and co-workers involved in this but that is not accessible to any others outside the consortium. So what we try to do then in the work package 9 is to sort of make sure that we have good communication between all work packages and make progress and this is an updated now version of this. Uh, <coughs> we try to sort of update uh, with time I mean sort of the progress we are making and ensure that everyone is communicating with each other so that the data is shared within the, the consortium. So then I will go into more how sort of the little bit how the data start to look now when we have started to do analysis and looking in more into detail in all the information that we, we are gathering either in the clinics or in the labs with the, the experimental um, parts. This is just an example <coughs> that we, if we, we can do the microbial data analysis and what you start with then is of course that we want to know what type of bacteria do we have, which are the most common and uh, here we can see that's the distribution where they have been collected and what you can see here is that we definitely have most cases within Copenhagen, not so many in Stockholm and uh, the fewest we do have in Karlskrona. Um, this is depends a little bit on the settings of the hospitals so because Copenhagen Rigshospital is a referral center so they get all uh, patients within Denmark basically coming coming there so that's also one of the reasons. Um, but you can see here red indicates streptococcal infections and I would say that they are the most predominant but you can also see that we do have quite a lot that we do not get any isolates from and that's the most challenging thing in, in actually in Copenhagen to get that because they have to go back to the hospital where the patient were initially admitted. But once you know that at least you know what samples may be most relevant to look into in more detail because we know we have a corresponding bacterial isolates. And then of course looking more into the clinical database and the clinical <coughs> and, and, and what has what is typical for the different patients and one thing there is that is really important of course is whether there are any comorbidities or not. Um, saying no com comorbidities that is no obvious comorbidity of course there could be something but not that we not that's obvious and and, uh, and um, some quite a few patients are associated with one type of comorbidity diabetes seems to be something that's quite commonly occurring but you can also have patients with s several different comorbidities. So this is of course something important to take into account and that may can may sometimes also explain why you have a mono or a polymicrobial infection. <coughs> and in <coughs> as I said in one of the work packages we're also analyzing the tissue samples so there we can also look whether we have inflammation or not within this particular samples that may be an indication that is more or less relevant to look at it or because we actually do want to look where we do have inflammation but it can also be important to compare at some stage with some that were more or less inflamed as well as looking then at the bacterial load which I show you the, the immunofreshion stains that we can do as well was it associated with high bacterial load or low bacterial load And then that takes us to uh, sort of how we have started then to select groups of patients and um, so this is the, the first um, set of, of selected groups. Um, so we decided to go uh, as, have as a first priority, so a group of patients which is P1 which will only involve then group A streptococcal infection, so a monomicrobial infection and no particularly comorbidity that, that <coughs> was obvious. Um, if there was so that we 
there may be one or one, not more than one, but there could be one comorbidity involved, but but no nothing in particular we're focusing on. And then we have a second priority, and that is actually to look more into the polymicrobial infections and where we do have certain comorbidities. And because we, we have seen that diabetes seem to be a comorbidity that is quite often associated with these infections. That is not reported in the literature, so there is no scientific evidence for that, but this has been sort of the general dogma within the hospitals that it th or the um, treating physicians have um, an idea that probably diabetic patients are more uh, susceptible to these type of infections. So that's something that we will look into more detail of course. And then as a third group is the group G streptococcal infections. We have also seen that they seem to be relatively common so the next uh, to the strepto group A streptococcal infections. The staphylococcal infections um, we had initially set out to also investigate but we do see now we do get very few staphylococcal uh, infections. There are some uh, and but they do never really seem to appear as monomicrobial. Um, they are rather um, polymicrobial and then of course you have the issue whether which was the first uh, to be there but of course it's important still so but maybe it's so that something else is required for staff or is actually to be able to um, colonize uh, and also cause these severe infections so then within <coughs> the the first then patient group p1 which is the only then associated to group based of the cochlear infections we have selected six different patients where we did have all the clinical isolates and we also had a distribution of uh, M uh, phenotypes and the bacteria. There is most of them have no comorbid, but there was one that was a COPD and, and smoker. You see uh, there's a predominance of females in this group. We didn't pay any te specific attention to this when we initially looked at this, that we l wanted to have this uh, sort of equally distributed. Um, because these were some of the first samples that we have got, so we decided to go for this. Um, they, they looked. We had samples from all different sort of sites, and uh, we had the we had the bacterial isolates. So they that they were the most complete set of samples that we had to start with. Um, so this is then. So then, out of these six, we started with 2006. We had to start somewhere. <laughs> we had used some other samples already just to make sure that all the processes of, of RNA and such that we could actually do this type of, um, of um, processing and analysis and once that was validated and, um, and, and robust we decided to go for the first uh, patient here on the list that was 2006 and so this is now what's going to happen that we will do a full set of analysis of this um, patient and this is in progress and uh, this is sort of the analysis we will be doing and at the meeting in September we ha hope to have everything ready for that and uh, processed, anal ana analyzed and that we can then discuss as all, th all the data generated and what has actually come out of the computational modeling as well at that time. So I don't have any data really to show you from that and the outcome of that yet but hopefully then end of uh, mid-September, end of September we would have a better idea of what it how well this this concept or approach actually working when it when all the data from the different experimental model systems coming together um, but i can just show you just one other example of what also have happened so far in 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 the project um, and that is that then in <coughs> taking um, an sti isolates and infect the experimental model system um the the murine models um w it has <coughs> uh, been identified certain chromosomes or genes invo involved in susceptibility versus resistance to the infections and uh, um s and this then generates something that's called quantitative trait locuses and um, this can look something like this. I'm not an expert to interpret this by any means, but I've just been told that where you have these peaks here, that's something that's quite interesting, so that's why I've highlighted them for you. And that indicates, and here there is um, 
than uh, quantitative trait loci, which are uh, then uh, involved in susceptibility to these infections. And um, this is on chromosome 2 as well as chromosome X. I thought this was interesting because we do see we may have a slightly bias towards uh, more female patients, uh, at least in the selected cohorts. So whether there is something on the X chromosome that, that um, is, is linked to this disease could potentially be of interest, of course. But uh, I don't know whether that has any bearing at all what's yet. But anyway, this is the data that has come out so far from infecting the um, the mice models and then the computational modeling people have started now to process this data in more detail and they <coughs> have then integrated the data to actually visualize the, the, the QTLs or the quantitative loci, um, trait loci uh, and then to integrate that with the transcriptomic data that we are now also about to generate. And then these lovely models do come out from, from the modeling um, p people and then they do highlight certain genes that um, are of potential interest. So this is a heat shock protein, uh, this IL-1 alpha um, and this one, I actually forgot on what that is stands for. Did I write that down? Yeah, so that if you're familiar with the proteasome, so that has to do with degradation of protein I intracellularly so within within the host cells. Um, so that's a component of the proteasome. And there is another um, molecule also uh, that has sort of come out as probably uh, potentially important as a trap molecule, which is downstream of TNF receptor signaling. Um, and then you can co make all these fancy pathway analysis or, or put together these pathways and out of that you can identify that the TRAF signaling pathway is uh, involved or the MAP kinase signaling pathway uh, and you have downstream of that you have the TRAF molecules and also other quite interesting pathways do come out is the oxidative damage pathway and also an ecosonoid synthesis pathway which which I find quite interesting because these are s um, these are associated with inflammatory responses and they're quite early markers. So that would be interesting when we start to do the metabolomics analysis. We will actually go into that in more detail and see whether there is something new. Um, not that we know that necessarily be so, but potentially maybe something that could be developed for as a diagnostic tool is if there's something sort of a very early uh, marker coming up. That would be quite interesting, I think, to follow up. But that's of course just speculation. But but um, it's interesting. Not that I can explain how you get to this stage, really. But but that's wha what the computational modelers are providing us with when getting all the 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 data together, so to say. I can just then finish off showing you some of the uh, experimental data that we have generated uh, within my laboratory, together with uh, Professor Norbert Teglund's laboratory. Um, where we have looked at tissue biopsies and also infecting the skin tissue model that we have set up and a novel finding that we did this was part of the project of course to do the infections in the models um, but then we also happened to do something novel uh, or do a novel finding which was quite interesting we thought but you can see it as a bit of a spin-off uh, um, to, to the <coughs> infect project I mean, we of course set out to do this because we wanted to better understand the pathogenesis and those the mechanisms behind the pathogenesis and, and why the bacteria are disseminating and, and what um, processes that may regulate that. Um, and this is the postdoc in the group, Nikolai Siemens, that has done all of this work, basically. So he's setting up the skin tissue model using fibroblasts from skin that he embed in collagen and then the collagen is remodeled modeled by the fibroblast and on top of that you can see the epithelial cells, the keratinocytes and once you air expose the tissue you will have a certification of, of the um, epithelial layer and you can then perturb the system by doing infections. And this is what it looks like, maybe not the best image, but this is a normal skin and this is the skin model and if you actually look into more detail 
of those layers that are formed, you can identify stratum corneum in both skin model and the <coughs> real skin, of course, and you see epidermal and dermal layers as well. And what we do in addition is that we do immunofreshance analysis um, and immunostainings to actually identify that there are certain essential structural components present both in the mo skin model as well as in normal um, skin. These are just some additional proteins, the keratins we have looked at, 1, 10 and 16, as well as fibronectin. Um, <coughs> but then of course, it, the really the what we aimed at was to be able to infect these uh, um, models um, and see whether we could model or mimic what's happening in, in real life. Um, we started off this with working with isolates, not from the infect project, but there was isolate that we had got earlier from a group in Canada, but they are also associated with um, uh, necrocytic soft tissue infections and they do have the M phenotypes as we do also see appearing in, the in our infect uh, clinical cohort. <coughs> and when we looked at this in more detail, we could see that the bacteria was over time actually disseminating within the tissue. So upon 24 to 48 hours of infection, we did uh, detect quite a few bacteria that had penetrated through the skin layer and uh, were found closely associated with the fibroblast or the dermal layer of the skin model. We looked at this in is a bit more detail. Um, <coughs> it's maybe hard to see, but what we saw when we did these 3D reconstructions of the model when we had done immunofreshance and immunostaining analysis was that we saw quite diffuse nuclear stainings. Um, you can see that in blue, the f in the diffuse blue staining, we could see that sort of dispersed within the tissue and we thought that that actually looked somewhat like biofilm and no one has re had reported so far that the streptococcal infections associated with necrotizing soft tissue infections were associated with biofilm. So we thought that, that was interesting and and decided to take this further and uh, we did then again the infections with the three different isolates um, and we do um, did um, uh, scanning electron microscopy on this and what we then found was that there was clearly a uh, biofilm formation within the tissue model. So that is the f also <coughs> relatively un uh, relatively rare I would say that that um, um, a biological uh, platform like this is used for bacteria to, to form biofilm on. Usually glass or plastic has been used, but now we do actually have more of the sort of physiological setting where we allow the bacteria to form the biofilm. So that is what I meant with the novel finding that, that we, we <coughs> observed. Um, and then, of course, we went to the back to the tissue from the patients, and now we go back then to the infect clinical isolates, or, or, the, or not the clinical isolates, but the but the clinical samples, and um, <coughs> stain them with gram staining with the streptococcal are um, gram positive, so they should stain positive for gram stain, and that you see them here in blue, and you could clearly see a lot of extracellular cocci and chains within the tissue, and one can of course also ask the question whether are they also appearing as intracellular bacteria um, and are there any biofilm-like structures and we thought we could see that just by doing this type of, of, inf of stainings but when we all again then did the scanning electron microscopy um, we did observe biofilm also in the, s in the um, tissue biopsies from the patients and these are now patients from the infect cohort so that we have then established that they are forming biofilm and this is something that's really relevant for the clinical, um, uh, for the treatment of the bacteria. So clinically this is really, really important because it's known that bacteria tend to be more resistant to antibiotics when they are in biofilm and also of course that could serve as a reservoir and that's why maybe the bacteria are not cleared properly um, upon infection. We continued on this a little bit just to look at the pathology as well of the skin, the tissue model to see when infected <coughs> you can see that how the infection sort of progresses quite rapidly and it actually destroys the tissue model. We've also used this to look at um, certain um, 
gene expressed that are associated with violence in <coughs> of these pathogens or the bacteria. Again, we've used the Canadian cohort, but we have also confirmed this in the tissue of, of the infect patients. And these are another set of uh, violence genes, uh, two component system that we have also followed. And that was also to do to show the uh, capability of actually processing RNA from these uh, tissue models and that those models have then also been used for the dual, dual RNA sequencing and that data will then go into the computational modeling as well. So then to, to sum up <coughs> a bit on this um, that the enrollment of patients uh, is really go going according to plan we are estimating about four to five hundred within four or five years, but it looks as we're going to reach that and maybe even get more. This may not sound as so many. Uh, you oftentimes, um, I mean, you see that they do thousands and ten thousands of patients involved in several studies, but we have never estimated to have any more than this. Um, that was really how, how th the whole project was designed initially. Um, and this will provide a completely unique set of NSTI data and samples um, so that is something that will not just last for the five years of the infect project because we will be able to work on this for for many many years it we have shown that using the muron experimental model um, we have been able to identify uh, <coughs> a few uh, quantitative trait loci and um, so this looks promising as well and so all those uh, samples are also then process to be used in the computational modeling as I showed you. Um, we are able to do the multi-tissue RNA uh, isolation. We are also working on doing protein and that also looks quite promising actually. So that, that looks good. Um, platforms have been established so they are really just waiting to be populated now with all the data that we are generating. But it so far it looks really promising now that we have started to generate data that can go into the Modul <coughs> computational modeling platforms. Um, so I would say that it, it's we are doing quite good progress there right now. And as I said, also novel findings can come out of something like this when you process your samples for uh, maybe another purpose, but you then observe something quite interesting and you follow that up and you can identify that these uh, bacteria are also forming <coughs> biofilms. And as I said, this is really of considerable clinical relevance as uh, we know that it may be more difficult to diagnose and it's also associated with antibiotic resistance when we have bacteria in these uh, structures. Um, one other aim we have now as the model has been established that is that we can use it to start to, to test and it maybe improve some, some therapeutic strategies that we have in mind to see whether we in a more physiological environment can actually do something to the bacteria, maybe um, interfere with some of the toxins that are produced by the bacteria to, to uh, monitor whether pathology can be be um, reduced. So the biofilm manuscript has just or, b or relatively early uh, recently been submitted to Journal of Investigative Dermatology, so we're waiting to hear from them maybe within a couple of weeks or so. We are just about to submit the paper now in June. Um, another interesting finding that has come out that it looks as the streptoc the G streptococci and group A streptococci do to seem to differ a little bit in, in how they cause uh, the pathology. <coughs> so uh, hopefully um, by the end of this project um, we uh, should be able to um, provide some evidence-based guidelines for classification and management of these infections um, as we gain more insight into them that is is most likely to be um, and hopefully we can develop new and improved diagnostic tools. We have already started to get quite a lot of novel insight into the pathophysiology of the disease and of course we this is an <laughs> important aspect of the project is that we can show that systems medicine can be used maybe to solve or maybe not solve but at least to better understand the complexity of human infectious diseases.
and uh, there are many societal benefits as well as, as uh, that we can increase the awareness of NSTIs and hopefully reduce then health and care costs if we can earlier on prevent the infections to progress to the most severe forms as we do sometimes see today. And I would say that we, if you look at this here, training of research and medical staff, of course we have already done a lot of progress here because all the five hospitals involved have been able to um, get their teams together. So the, the awareness and also the training is of course uh, substantial at these clinical sites. And there will be a lot o of clinical experiences sort of coming out from that uh, that can be passed on and distributed to other, other hospitals well in the future. And this is a relatively small study, as I said, but that was the intention to start with. Hopefully it will serve as a basis then for us to design um, and optimize sort of future clinical trials, which could then be broadened. We have now only included hospitals within Scandinavia, but that of course then could be uh, widened to include uh, other hospitals as well, all globally. And just again to highlight, if you are interested to learn more about the project and the different uh, parts being undertaken, please visit the web page and uh, there you can get more information. There you can also find all contact details to the partner members if you're interested in any particular aspect of this. Um, so please do that and thank you very much for listening and, and well. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any, and as I said, I will stay for lunch as well, so you're more than welcome to um, to discuss with me.